so thank you uh, for allowing me to talk about this <clears throat> work that we've been doing in the UK. And what I wanted to start off actually by doing is giving a, a little bit of a um, <clears throat> an update on what's been happening in the UK generally on bacteriophages, because it has actually been quite an exciting year. And then I'll talk about some of the work that we've been doing, I think over about the last perhaps three, uh, four years, uh, specifically on this topic. And I'll show you some very new data, largely the data I'm showing you is, has not been published, but I think it's very interesting and I would like to share it. So this year, there was um, a UK government inquiry as to why bacteriophages are not being resourced to the level, uh, well, or why research in this area is not being resourced to the level it should be. So Jonathan just uh, illustrated really uh, nicely how, in a way, unset up most countries are in terms of putting phages into, into a clinical context. There's, there's no framework. It's great that we have our Georgian colleagues here to share what they've been doing for years. They have frameworks and systems, but most countries don't. So it's actually incredibly difficult to, um, to incorporate them within our existing structures. So clearly we need to address many aspects, not just the science aspects, but the regulation aspects and the production aspects and, and the whole chain. So there is, um, the, the, many of you contributed to this inquiry, for which I'm very grateful. Essentially, uh, there was a select committee of science and technology, whereby um, scientists, doctors, um, business people, pharma, uh, came and gave evidence and different aspects of bacteriophage uh, biology and what we can do in the UK and what we can't do, and what needed to be researched. We had the global perspectives and we had evidence from funders um, and regulators. And as a result of this, there's going to be a government, uh, a, a report that goes to the government, and they have a certain amount of time to, to respond to it. And really, it should help feed into things like our national antimicrobial resistance um, strategy document. So I was in London, I think, two weeks ago, uh, where this document is being drafted, and the policy writers were actually checking that we'd captured uh, the information correctly. So it's, it's, it's been a really interesting process to see how we can actually improve the, the momentum and the amount of resource into this area working together as a as a community within the UK. Um, the other big news from uh, well hopefully from a whole UK perspective but certainly um, it's been great from a Leicester perspective is finally um, we've now established a bacteria page research centre in Leicester so there was a Competition within the university to establish centres. I think there were 17 applications of which, um, as was the only new centre that was funded. And this has been great because the university has already put in more resources. We have another lecturer, um, a research technician. And the idea of the centre is to uh, establish a well curated UK page bank, developing standards for the um, sort of acceptable standards. So we, we're all throughout all the different researchers who are working in this area will use the same methods to uh, characterize genomes, <coughs> phenotypic characterization, so we can standardize these processes and then we can compare our phages much better um, between ourselves. So recently actually as a result of this phage opening, the MHRA, so the um, Medicine and Healthcare Regulatory Agency, the representatives at our centre opening, they came along and they were surprised that uh, about the fact that we are, that the regulation was mentioned so often and actually started to work together and I just got a grant to work directly with them to define what's in a product so this is really good because it will help then give um, our doctors the, <laughs> the reassurance that uh, the, the product it contains what they think it contains so the idea is to to, to build to, to bring the entire um, well UK particularly phage community together uh, and wider to help progress phage technology and also a large teaching element. So the down the side here, these are we already have large banks of all these phages. So essentially what we were doing in the phage center was formalizing what we've been doing for about the last 15 years anyway uh, and expanding to build capacity. And I've spoken many times over the years at this meeting about the work I've been done on clostridium phages, mainly on clostridium difficile, also done quite a bit on that for engines. And I've also spoken about our large uh, scale poultry work. So over the last uh, five years, we've had a, a big project looking at poultry pathogens. And this has been great because we've done about five trials now where between one and 2,000 
birds per trial, which means we've been able to get really large numbers of, um, of animals in order to do things like ghost response, um, formulation, delivery. So I've also spoken about that data quite a bit before. So today what I thought I'd do is talk about this work by looking at urinary tract infections and looking at Klebsiella and E. coli phages. So bringing what we've learned from those other phages into that system. So essentially the, the phage centre, the reason why I think hopefully I should be able to make a bit of traction within our own institution is that we have a lot of active uh, clinical trials going on in different areas. It's the biggest centre in the UK for respiratory clinical trials, for example. And then we interface with lots of other uh, centres. So we have a centre for pre precision health, really good structural and chemical um, biology institute. So we can have, therefore help to get things done, a more mechanistic understanding of, of phages. Also, we have, uh, we're working more intensely with our maths, mathematical modeling centre and also with the uh, LIAS, our Centre for Advanced Studies. So we're building in the component of understanding that um, uh, cultural component. So developing phages within a culturally um, acceptable framework. So, so the question really is how within the UK context do we go from this? Knowing that knowing phages are everywhere, they're really diverse, uh, and they affect most bacterial pathogens we would like to eliminate, to, um, to getting products in the NHS. So here is uh, the, the products that they use, uh, I mean, sample products used in Georgia. But how do, how do we um, integrate those into our own NHS system? So the reason why I started uh, to initiate this, this project with the other is, is because I was joined by this woman here, Melissa Hayes. So she spends half her time in our hospitals in Leicester, working with Sweden as an infectious disease doctor, and half the time in our lab working on bacteria pages. And we worked with a health economist, um, Dr. Martin Noel Gru, and she um, really made the very good point that I think Jonathan was also alluding to that you have to have, unless a phage product is better than an existing product, why would you develop it? So the hospitals care about budgets and money. <laughs> so you need you need to, I was thinking, where, where should we where should we build? And that within our phage, yeah. where can I focus? To actually get something to a state where we can actually use phages and make the most difference. And we've chosen UTIs because it is just such a um, per persistent and common problem. And because half of all sepsis cases are thought to stem from a UTI infection. So the bits that we're doing, and I want to tell you about today, was we're working to improve and um, characterize our phage cocktails. So we've Find cocktails on pages that will find individual pages which we've combined um, and, and tested extensively to um, make cocktails and the line as the other. And I'm actually at heart and by training uh, an ecologist. So I've been trying to apply some ecological frameworks to understand better understand pages so that each time you want to work on a disease, we don't have to go do these same <laughs> extensive uh, tests of um, that are incredibly time consuming, doing all um, and so, so doing all our testing our individual phages for virulence and for host range, and then doing all the different combinate many combinations of double and treble and four phages. Can we not just try and figure out what are the traits and the characteristics of phages that we can use and we'll know that these ones have better ones clinically? And then I want to just show you some work on um, that we've got some very, very recent data looking at the efficacy of phages uh, in catheters and in our mouse model. So in this project, in this project, we have a neurologist from the University Hospitals in Leicester, um, Laura Nietzsche, who is largely from two PhD students, Karen Adler and uh, Risker. Um, so this is the motivation for um, UTIs. Essentially, uh, you can see 400 million UTIs diagnosed globally across the NHS, about 450 million pounds a year. Um, long hospital stays, a lot of bloodstream infections, and there's growing issues with AMR. We look at the pathogens um, in the UK that cause UTIs. You can see the, the first A is the data for um, from 2017 to 21. You can see E. coli is the biggest offender, and um, Klebsiella is also an important pathogen there. The B is the data just from the 2021, 20, uh, uh, 20, which is the most recent um, data we have. Um, 
So, so clearly, these, these is why, this is why we've fixed on these two pathogens of um, E. coli and Klebsiella. We're also building up Enterococcus collections as well. So it's not new to think of doing um, page 30 in UTIs. Clearly, this important problem has motivated many people over the years. And these are just some of the interesting studies that have been published recently on that topic, including a, also a very nice paper by Grosky's uh, team looking at how the prevalence of phages within the urinary tract. Um, and there are actually six listed clinical trials uh, on Georgia, uh, three in, in, the, in the States, led by um, Locus and Applied Therapy, um, Phage Therapeutics, once in Iran and once in, in Canada, which has just been resourced. So, as I said, what I think we can do within our system is is these, these um, is is try to understand what what the strains are that we like to target better and develop that ec better ecological understanding of phages, and then also see how they would work in, in models that we can link that data to the MHRA to allow us to do the trial in the in our UK setting. So, when it comes to actual phages, how do we go from um, <laughs> understanding which phages we, we should actually use. So what you're seeing here is a program that I wrote with, um, or, uh, I should say, Thomas, <laughs> one time he's in the audience, he'll talk later today. So him and his team in, in Denmark, together with people in Leicester, we've been trying to understand the whole phage phase, looking at genomic interactions um, in order to sort of better understand the dynamics of phages within the genus or phages that target specific species of bacteria, I should say. So if we take Klebsiella, you can see all these little dots um, are represent the size of a specific genome. And what you can see is if there's just a circle of little dots, those phages have nothing in common with those phages genetically. So how do we how do we actually then choose which are going to be the best phages to look at? Um, so for example, these are uh, this is a cloud for Klebsiella, and all the yellow ones we've got in our collection. So and we've tested individually each phage, but how do we know? How do we know that we're actually using the right phages? So of course we look at the um, well, of course we look at the virulence index, which is how effectively they kill. So this is um, we can just show, just show you this one here. These are the um, this is the optical density of the control strain growing. And this is one with added phages, and the area you integrate the area onto the curve to get a definitive virulence index. So this was a method established by Dominic Savage from the University of Alberta in Canada. And uh, at least it gives us an objective measure of uh, how effective the individual bacteriophages and the cocktails are. So we have a phage cocktail that looks well, looks good in the researchers of the flasks on the coli, um, and also on the same cocktail. So this is what we what we've been testing is a is one cocktail that contains Klebsiella and E. coli phages. So the idea is that we would have just this one cocktail that we do give to patients with UPIs, um, with, uh, so it's not going down the individual um, approach in, in this particular case. There would be advantageous. It'd be, <laughs> you know, there's always a big finding about this in, in these meetings. I think it's really interesting. I think there's clearly room for personalized approaches and for an off the shelf product. And that's again completely learning from our Georgia friends. You try one, you try something that hopefully uh, catches all. And if not, we can go more specific. So we um, showed that the cocktail works, and cocktail four works uh, well in um, a strain of a Klebsiella, which we wanted to use as a mouse model because it was an established mice model with this strain. So that's what we focused on. Um, so I want to just quickly spend a few moments just talking about what I mean by um, taking this, taking, getting a better understanding of phages and the, trying to work out how, what, what, are, what are the traits basically of the phages that we all want to then look for in new phages? So, you know, how do we know should we use a phage from this cloud or this cloud or this cloud? So the things we tend to look at are things like phase range, resistance, stability, can it be propagated? Up? But what's the sort of underlying biology and how can we tease that apart within the uh, context of knowing that they're quite diverse and uh, a lot of genes don't have annotated structures. So some of you possibly have heard me talk about this before, but what I've been trying to be is repurpose um, a different um, ecological framework. So this is a framework that works really well to identify and categorize all British plant species. So it was developed uh, in the 60s and 70s by somebody called Brian. And uh, 
uh, he, he was an academic at Sheffield University, and essentially he can classify all plants according to their stress, their ability to compete, how compete other plants, um, and then their ability to cope with the stirrings. So I don't know, um, I could give a whole talk on this, which I'm not going to do now within this talk, but I just want to say that, that the, the, this is a really well robust defended framework. So I'm seeing if I can repurpose it to see if they just, it may not be the ultimate framework that, that works with phages, but I'm at least giving it a go. And the way that I'm doing that is looking at, I'm going to um, uh, show you here, the way I'm doing it is looking at the amount of genes within a phage that are transcribed um, straight after the bacteriophage infectious bacteria, so that the early and middle and late, so we know that all phages, when they infect, they have to interact with the host systems, so they have to replicate and they have to make phages. So depending on their strategy, you can imagine that um, so, so some phages we know they, they infect and they ma massively change the architecture of that bacteria. And then they, uh, when they've sorted everything out, then they replicate. And others, they go in quickly and replicate using exists more or less what's there already. Uh, so I'm using this sort of as a proxy uh, for, that, uh, for that system that I mentioned within the plant. So essentially I'm looking at the amount of genes that are expressed at different stages of uh, transcriptional takeover. So this should give me um, an idea of, of, of how those phages are interacting. So, we, to, um, so when I've actually looked at all the existing literature of, um, of phages, and actually surprisingly few phages have been transcriptionally profiled. I was <laughs> very much interested in Rob's uh, group has done a great job with the Pseudomonas uh, phages and we're following very similar uh, methods that they've developed to then look at our um, E. coli phages. So it's interesting, actually, if you look at his phages, so most of them are actually in this uh, in this middle box. So they have little traits of all of the <laughs> of all of my characteristics that I mentioned. So what I'm thinking is that it could, it could easily be that by selecting for phages that have good host range and good virulence, perhaps we're selecting for a certain type of phages. Whereas maybe we should be looking at perhaps ones that can survive in more stressful environments. We we don't know. But what I am doing is taking phages that I know work really well in our E. coli. Um, UTI infections and seeing um, and transcriptionally profiling them to see what types of profiles they have. So to try and get a better understanding of those phages. Okay. The other thing that we're doing is trying to find phages that grow on stationary um, cells. So this is just to remind you that a, uh, a stationary phage cell at the bottom looks very different to an exponentially growing bacteria cell. And in many infections, the, the Bacteria we actually want to treat are, they're, they're not really, they're, they're just, they're, they're, they're sort of stuck in little crevices and cranulated surfaces within that infection. So can we find phages that actually will target those stationary phase cells better? So often we went hunting to um, various slimy areas. It's actually around beautiful areas of park outside Leicester called Bradgate Park. And uh, my students scraped a whole load of uh, uh, rocks <laughs> where uh, you can see there's established biofilm on the rocks and from this she isolated many phages that target E. coli but of all the, the phages that she selected she only found one that could actually infect the stationary phase bacteria so there are methods that have been developed by Alexander Harms who's now just recently moved to Zurich um, to, to make sure you robustly uh, only finding phages that can target those cells. So that you look at, to do this, you look at viral cells, infected cells, and, and free virions within this. And um, what, uh, oh, it's amazing that this is not showing this thing, but essentially, she, um, my, my uh, this, this the student, the careful student in my lab, Sadie Perry, was able to show that this one particular phage um, clearly infects stationary cells. We don't really know, uh, what makes this phage different from other phages, but a heat map analysis that shows, that shows to us that the, um, essentially there are many genes that seem to be missing in this phage. I was looking for unique genes that might be present in it, but it seems to be the opposite. Okay, so now I would like to show you the work that we've been doing, um, uh, setting up for what seems like forever, because in order to look at human catheters, which we wanted to do, we wanted to take natural communities of infected human catheters, and then see if our phage cocktail worked in them. But because catheters can clean themselves, it falls under the Human Tissue Act, 
<laughs> so the six months of uh, ethical conditions later, we are now working um, with the Leicester based urologist uh, and my students. She went to the clinic and got um, catheters from patients who had an infection within that catheter. We checked with Moldy that they, they had the strains that aphages could target, so just to the level of E. coli um, and Klebsiella. And then we, um, so this is this is a, an artificial blood that we must set up. So we have the catheters are in these little uh, chambers here. We drip urine through at a physiologically representative rate, and we can put phages into that urine and look to see um, how good the phages are at clearing them. So we've been doing a really interesting method of analyzing these infected catheters using micro CT scanning. So at Warwick University, we have a national facility for uh, um, CT tomography. So this is really nice because it means that you can analyze your catheters in a non-destructive way. So just purely by doing a CAT scan or a CT scan of those of those catheters, we can see how effective the phages are. So you can see these were the, 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 the this, this is the community of bacteria surrounding inside the cath catheter. So that's the sort of transverse view that you then at that catheter. And um, we can see that actually it's almost clear from this picture here. We can see this is the untreated catheters here, and this is after we've treated them with phages. So this looks really um uh promising. In, in the, um, as I say, it's just that then the, the show, shows that a broad post range cocktail of pages appears to be able to then treat nicely the um, those natural community of the <laughs> um, So, the final thing I want to share with you is the development of our mouse model. So, the model is so essentially what we do here is that we uh, use transurethra injection of the <laughs> bacteria and phages directly into the bladder of the mouse. So this is not a, a new model. In fact, it was established in 1983. Um, but I put this quote from a, a, a recent paper. It says, um, it's, so it's a long-established but technically demanding procedure. <laughs> so to my knowledge, it's not been used with phage uh, investigating phages before. But essentially, it could be a really nice model for us to understand the dynamics of bacteriophages and, and really get that information on safety and efficacy within a well-defined model. So uh, someone from our animal house, Julie, had to get some extra training. We have a really good animal house. We brought breed our colonies of mice, but um, only one person actually can, can do this procedure. And so she, um, and sadly, she's got COVID at the moment. We'll have even more data to show you. <laughs> but uh, essentially, I'll show you the data from the first trial we had, and I'll show you what we did. So we we um, we have four groups, 15 mice per group. So we have one group that just have Klebsiella, one half Klebsiella, and then phages. So we establish the infection for two days, and then we treat with phages. Uh, so currently we can run the model for a week, but we just had our ethical um, permission change. We can now run it for a month, which should be really interesting. So we treat it with phages day two, and four hours later we looked at um, at the number of, of, of phages, both in the urine, and then we also sacrificed some mice to look at the number of phages in the kidneys and um, in the bladder. And then the end point of these experiments was at seven hours. So I will show you the data now. So you can see that four hours after the, um, we take the bladder homogenate, four hours after those mice were treated, uh, the infections had um, that all of the uh, Klebsiella have been removed. Now the urine is really interesting. What the, uh, the way they, I found this really interesting the way they collect the data here. So what they do is when the mice are tiny, little like literally, just, they, they give them a special a mouse treat if they urinate, <laughs> because mice, unlike humans, um, they just we all the time. So you have to train them just to actually urinate when you want to. So you give them a little treat, and then you can pull it the urine <laughs> day by day by day by day. By day. <laughs> So it's like a little bit of a puff rice that has a bit of sugar in it. Anyway, so this allows you to collect uh, non-destructively the, the urine, so that's why we've got more time points here, because you don't have to sacrifice them every day. And so we can see that the phages, um, the phage-treated uh, animals, you can see that the, the, there's no Klebsiella uh, in, the, in the urine after day five. And the kidneys, again, we can see a rapid clearance of um, Klebsiella, and then it grew back in the animals that were untreated, but not in those animals that had been treated. So this is just, it's quite preliminary data. It's just um, relatively small numbers of mice. 
and um and it's just one dose one one um the fake the, the, the device only received one dose of phages so at the moment with that's 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 sort of where we are but we're now looking at different um delivery routes of delivery into that into that model and we're looking at extending the time and also doing other um doing multiple doses of, of those bacteriophages but now we've got that model established i think it's going to give us a lot of this quite robust data yep i'm done <laughs> so just uh include i think people are doing this uh, how i'm trying to integrate that ecological understanding into our work um highlighted the gaps and i'll show you some great days this makes me to thank uh Everyone in the lab, this was us on there. Um, lab IT, the local llama of Thank you very much for your attention. Have a good day.